I'm going to ask you all one question real quick, and then you all are going to reply. And then after that, total silence, okay? Yeah? All right. The question is this. I'm going to ask you all to pay attention for roughly 30 or so minutes. Can you all do that? Yes. Let's try that again. Can I get a yes from that? Yes. Yes. Okay. 30 minutes, okay? Just roughly 30 minutes of your time. Just be a little bit quiet for me. Try to focus. Um, and then we'll be able to get out of here and you all be able to go play again. But just for 30 minutes, please try to keep it down a little bit so that we can actually focus in on God's word, okay? I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get started. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather here today. I pray that you will open up all of our ears, including my own, um, as I'm up here teaching. I pray that you will silence our tongues, except for mine, because I need to be the one teaching, so it'd be bad if I went to, uh, mute. Uh, but God, please just be present with us right now. Help me not say anything apart from what you want me to say, and guide my words guide my teaching and help it impact um, all these young people's lives so that whenever they leave here they will be changed and they will have a growing and longing desire to live for you and show you um, to all the people around them. God, please be with us. Let us set aside any distractions. Let us not talk to our neighbors, but let us focus wholly and totally on you. We're trusting in you, God, so please be with us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to start off with a story. Earlier, um, one of the questions on here, also, by the way, we're starting a new series today. Uh, this is just the first of, I think, three weeks. It's called Underestimated, and we're talking about um, ways how sometimes we can be underestimated in our faith and how we actually want to go out and kind of, contrary to what people th might think of us, we want to um, shine our lights and set a good example for everybody in regards to showing the gospel. But earlier, one of the questions was, man, I'm having a tough time with this microphone thing. It's not going to stick in my ear, but that's all right. Um, I'll just be messing with it the whole time. Uh, but one of the questions on there was that we saw one person, one of the underdogs, who stood before a giant man, and he said, you know, you come with me with swords and spears. I come to you in the name of the Lord, right? And that person, he actually shared my name. His name was David. And I want to start off by just talking about the story of David. It's one that a lot of us are very familiar with, but it sound, it's a very good setup for where we're heading with um, this whole series, being underestimated. So if you all don't know, David was one of many sons. His dad's name was Jesse. He grew up in a town called Bethlehem, which was a very small town at the time. Um, it's grown in the last 2,000 years or so uh, due to the birth of a very famous person um, back then. His name was Jesus. Right, So David and Jesus were both from the same area, but David was about a thousand years earlier, and he was Jesus' great-great-great-great-great-great-grandson, uh, grandfather, um, reverse that. Um, so Jesus was descended from David, and the story of David begins in 1 uh, Samuel, not 1 Samuel, uh, begins in 1 Samuel chapter 16, um, shortly after the current king of Israel has been rebuked by the prophet Samuel, um, because he hasn't been obeying God. And Samuel says that God has chosen another king, and this new king will be a man after God's own heart. And so the next chapter in 1 Samuel uh, 16, we have Samuel who shows up at the house of David, or better, at the house of Jesse, David's father, and he says, hey, one of your sons is going to be the next king of Israel. Bring your sons before me, and God will let me know which one it is. And so Jesse brings out his sons, right? Uh, there's Eliab, and um, I don't remember all their names, but there's a bunch of them. I probably should have thought of that before I said it. Uh, but he brings out all the sons, and Samuel sees the biggest and tallest one, and he's like, now that guy, he looks like a king, right? He's, the, he's tough, he's a warrior, and he's ready for kingship by worldly standards. Um, but then God tells him, no, that's not the king. So Samuel goes to the next son, and this guy, once again, he's a warrior, buff guy, tall guy, and God says, no, you're not the king. And Samuel goes through every single one of Jesse's sons, and none of them are the king. And Samuel's kind of confused by that because he's like, well, God, you said that one of Jesse's sons is the king, but I've looked at all of them and none of them are the king. And that's whenever God says to Samuel, well, the Lord looks to the outward appearance. Or no, man looks to the outward appearance, but the Lord looks to the heart. And so we're not looking at outward appearance. We're looking at the contents of a person's heart. And there's another son. Right? So Samuel goes back to Jesse and he says, hey, do you by chance have another son? 
Like maybe some son that you just didn't think to bring out because you thought he wasn't worthy of being a king. And sure enough, Jesse says, well, yeah, there's this one, uh, my youngest son, his name's David, but he's just a shepherd and he's out in the fields. I didn't really call him forward because he had a job he had to do. He needed to watch the sheep. These are my warrior sons. They're the ones you would probably want to be a king. But Samuel says, how about this? Go call David. So David comes out. David's very well known for being, uh, he writes a lot of music. You know, if you've ever read the Psalms, I think like half of them are written by David, maybe more than that. Um, but David was known for writing his music, but he was also known for being a very valiant shepherd, right? He killed lions and bears and stuff. Um, but he was still overlooked. He was the youngest son, and nobody thought he would be king. Well, he comes before Samuel, and Samuel looks, and sure enough, God's like, yeah, this is the king. So Samuel anoints David, and the youngest son is on the path to becoming the next king of Israel, even though nobody expected it. Fast forward a little while, David's still going back to being a shepherd. We don't exactly, um, he was pretty much living by faith. Uh, we don't know of exactly what he did in between that time to like set himself up to be the king of Israel. We do see this one instance where the current king was having these like fits of rage. And so David's actually welcomed into his court to play his music to soothe him. So it's like you can see God's hands and all of this getting David in the right position to become king. But still David's just going back and forth between the palace and the shepherd's fields. And he's kind of just doing his own thing. But then eventually the Philistines wage war on the Israelites. And there's this big giant guy. What's his name? Goliath. Goliath. Okay, I know I said that I wasn't going to have you all talk again, but that was the exception. Unless I do it again later. We'll see. Um, but Goliath, he's this big giant of a man, um, probably 10 feet tall. He comes out and he says, send out your champion. And one-on-one -on -one we'll fight each other, and then nobody else has to die. It's actually a pretty smart battle strategy. Rather than having two armies coming against each other and killing a bunch of people, you just choose the best man on both armies, send them out, one-on-one -on -one they fight each other, and the loser, instead of them dying, they just become slaves. Um, which obviously some people would probably rather die than become a slave, but ultimately it is a pretty good um, strategy. So Goliath comes out, and for 40 days he says, send me your best man. But they're afraid. They don't have anybody like Goliath. But then one day Jesse tells David to go visit his brothers, who are soldiers in Saul's army. And he says, hey, here's some cheese and stuff. Go bring your brother some food. They're probably hungry. They've been on the battlefield. So David goes, and as he's there, he happens to hear Goliath come out and, you know, say, hey, send people to fight me. And David immediately, he just, he's angry. He's like, how can y'all, like the army of the Lord, how can y'all stand here and let this blaspheming giant say these things about us? Like, you represent God. And you're afraid to fight this 10-foot-tall giant? Do you know how big God is? So much bigger. And you've got to imagine, this is a small David talking to fully grown men. But he's like, our God's so much bigger than that. And things happen, and eventually David ends up being the person they trust to go out there um, to fight Goliath. And they try to give David some armor, but he's like, I don't need armor. I've never used armor. Um, I just need a sling. I need my shepherd's staff, and I just need to go get some rocks. So he goes and gets five smooth stones um, from a brook nearby. He only needed one because it would only take one to defeat the guy. But he grabs five, you know, just in case the guy had some brothers, which he did. So I don't know. Maybe he killed them all. Uh, but he goes and grabs these stones. Then he goes and it's really like the way the story builds up. This is 1 Samuel chapter 17. Like you can just like picture it in your mind. And I think that's the best way to read the Bible. Try to immerse yourself in the story. And David is on one side of the Valley of Elah. And there's like these two hills, right? The Valley of Elah is right in the middle. And David's on one side and Goliath's on the other. You've got this really short guy who might be y'all's age, maybe a little bit older. Uh, maybe like halfway between y'all and me. I don't know. Um, but he comes out there, this little dude facing a 10-foot tall guy. And that's when he says that thing that we saw there, right? He says, you come to me with swords and spears, but I come to you in the name of the uh, living God. And then after that, he says, he's pretty bold. Uh, I'd be probably a little bit nervous to say this, but he says, you know what? I'm going to come over there and I'm going to cut off your head. And you're like, whoa, it's like a little guy saying some pretty mighty words. Like, you don't want to say that because uh, if you're wrong, you're in for it. But he's confident. He says, no, I might be small, but I'm coming in the name of, like, living God. And so you've been thinking David's the underdog? Turns out he's not. Turns out that David's actually, like, well, Goliath's the underdog. He's taller and he's bigger and he's more muscular and he's a trained warrior, but he's the underdog in the story. 
And then I love it whenever the two come together. It says that Goliath came out like, you know, he's just like walking slowly and he's got his armor bearer with him. And David, he comes running. I, lo- like I, just, I was reading that about a month and a half ago and I never noticed that detail. But it says David ran to the, uh, to the middle line of the battlefield. So Goliath's just like, you know, he's just casually, David's like, he's sprinting. He's like running and boom, cast the stone. Goliath goes down and David shoots to superstardom. There's a bunch of stuff that happens in between, uh, like after that story, but David becomes a superstar, a lot of stuff happens, and eventually, after all, he faces a lot of stuff, he eventually does become the king of Israel, and um, it's just a great story. It's really one of those ones I'm surprised they haven't made it into more movies, or more high-quality movies. There's been a lot of movies about David, but they're usually pretty bad. Um, But it, it really is probably one of the most cinematic stories of the Bible. It's one of my favorite I'd always like to say David's one of my favorite characters other than Jesus, and it's not just because we share the same name, it's just because David is truly a person you want to be like, except for a few stories in there where you definitely don't want to mimic him. Uh, But the point of this is that David is the classic example of somebody who's been underestimated, right? His father underestimated him, his brothers underestimated him, even the prophet Samuel underestimated him because he didn't think that David was fit to be a king. Whenever David shows up at the battlefield, his brothers laugh at him, all the soldiers laugh at him. Saul is kind of like, okay, I know who you are, but I don't know if you should fight this giant. David is constantly being underestimated. Yet because God is with him, he can go out and do some crazy stuff. And I'm always hesitant to draw the parallel between us and David because a lot of the times it seems like Jesus is more of a parallel between, uh, with David than we are. But at the same time, Jesus is living inside of us, so it kind of works out. Um, but my point is this, is that a lot of the times we can be underestimated, especially younger people. Uh, they can be underestimated when it comes to great acts of faith. Um, kind of like David, you know, they just think, oh, you're the youngest person. Surely you're not going to be the king. Um, but the goal of talking today is we're going to actually talk about how all because you're young doesn't mean that you need to be underestimated. And how even from youth, you can be a leader. Uh, and so we're wanting to talk about that. So if you will, grab your Bible. Uh, And flip with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's near the end of the Bible. Um, So you're wanting a starting point. And I'm going to start in verse 6. And I'm just going to read a little bit. So uh, if y'all are still flipping there, I'm just going to start reading. This is written by Paul to his pupil Timothy. We don't know how old Timothy was. But Paul the Apostle, pretty famous guy. You used to persecute the church, ends up becoming one of the godliest saints ever who died for his faith. But uh, he's writing to Timothy, who is his, not his son, but he called him his son because he really loved Timothy and he really wanted Timothy to be a good servant of God. And this is what he says, starting in verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed, having nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather... Train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. And this next verse is what I really want you to focus on. Let no one despise you for your youth, But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. That's the verse that, it's really a verse, I hadn't really even noticed this verse until I think maybe two or three years ago. And now I hear it quoted all the time, it's crazy how that works. Um, But that verse right there really should impact every single young person. And um, older people too. Um, because it, reali- it makes us realize that we're not excused and that at any moment we should become leaders. Uh, and we should try to point people to Christ. But I'm going to read it one more time and then we're going to break it down. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. All right, so a lot of the times, um, and this is a true thing, a lot of times we look at older people and we say, wow, they have so much wisdom, which is true. Usually you... Um, are, you do get wiser with age. If you're not getting wiser with age, you're probably doing something wrong in life. Um, so older people typically are wiser. But that doesn't mean that people should look down on the younger people. right? And, but that, at the same time, that doesn't mean that Paul is justifying foolishness. 
Rather, he's calling us to learn from the wise people above us and to mimic them so that they can't look down on us by failing to apply their example. And he's saying to young Timothy here, he says that there are five different ways in which Timothy should strive to be an example for people. First, he says, you should be an example for all believers. The young people should be an example for all believers in speech. That's in what you say. You know, what you say and what, what you're going around, how you talk, the way you talk with your friends. You should set an example for people on how believers should be. And this can be wherever you go, right? Whether you're in your family, whether you're at church, or whether you're at school. Whether you're not at school, maybe all are, you and your friends are just hanging out at your house. The things that you say should be said for the explicit purpose of pointing people to Christ. So that really should challenge you, like, how do you, whenever you talk, do you sound like people who aren't saved? You know, are you cussing, as, do you cuss like all the people who, you know, they don't know Christ? Like, it's, it's funny how just small things, you could just change the way you talk in very small ways and people will notice. Um, and it doesn't even have to be with cussing. Cussing is just probably the most, the easiest example to apply. But there's just little things, the way you talk to people, it can actually point people to Christ because you can actually show them through your speech that you care for them. Right? When you talk to them, whenever, whenever you meet with somebody and you're talking to them back and forth, a lot of the times it's easy to get into a conversation where it's not a conversation at all. Really, one person's talking, and then whenever they're not talking, they're waiting to talk. They're not actually listening to the other person. Right? But as a Christian, we should love people. And whenever we're not talking, let's listen to them. And let's say, hey, I actually care about what you're saying. You know, that's what we need to do. So just in the way you talk to people, whether it be your family, your mother and your father, I think sometimes we can say things that we don't, uh, we shouldn't say to our mother and father, but we need to be careful there. He also says that you should be an example in conduct. These are the things that you do, right? The things that you do in life should be different. The Bible constantly uses the word holy to describe believers in Christ. Be holy as I am holy. That's what God says. So the things you do should be set apart. Whenever you're going out and the things you're interested in, the things that you are constantly pursuing in life, are they the same things that the people outside of the church are pursuing? Like, he's calling us to being radically different, and this is why he's saying that nobody should despise you because of your youth, because whenever they examine you, even at a young age, they should be able to know what you stand for. They should be able to look at you, and they should be like, wow, this person, they might not know what they're going to do in the future, they might not know where they're going to go to college, but man, they know that they love Jesus. And, they, and whatever they do, whether they eat or drink, whatever they do, they're doing it for the glory of God. And that's what we want to do. Whatever we say, whatever we do, in our speech, in our conduct, and then he also says in our love. Really, this is our, the purpose statement of a Christian, right? Or really of all people. Um, the Christians are the ones who have the cheat code to the uh, actual meaning in life, you know. Uh, it's to love God and to love your neighbors, to love all people. Um, the way you love should be different. The way the world loves is often a give and take. You do something for me, I'll do something for you. But that's not how, Christian, uh, how Christians love. And that's not the love of Christianity at all. The love of Christianity is rooted in the gospel, right? Whenever we were unworthy for God's love, and we were literally worthless because we sinned against him, he still loved us enough to come down in the flesh and die for us. And if he's willing to do that for us, we should be willing to do that for others, right? Right? Like, sometimes we get mad at people just for the smallest things, and we get so frustrated by, like, whenever we lose Wi-Fi connection. And you realize, like, those are such tiny things in the broad scope of things. The God of creation stepped down in the flesh and died for us even though we didn't deserve it. That should radically change how we live. Whenever we love people, we should love people with that same love. Because, I mean, like, if not, what's the point? Like, if God's going to show us that love and we're not going to love others that way, it doesn't make sense. People should be able to look at us, and within just, like, 30 seconds, they should be able to know something's different about this person. Like, just the way they're talking to me, there's this love just coming from them. And it's not a self-seeking love. They're not talking to me because they want something from me. They're talking to me because they want to give something to me. It's like they have access to life that I've never known, and they want to share that with me. And it's, it should perplex them. To where they should be asking questions like, what's different about you? How are you so joyful all the time? How are you so energetic? How are you so happy? And it doesn't, you're not always going to be happy, but you can't always be joyful even if you're not happy. That's one of the fruits of the gospel. He also says that you should be an example in faith. 
Right? And once again, I, I want to emphasize, he's not talking to just anybody. He's talking to a young person. He's saying, you, a youth, a young person, should be an example here. Where even the, old, the oldest person in the church should be able to look at you and be inspired because of how you're an example in the faith. And what is faith? Faith is to trust in God. In every aspect of life, you should strive to trust God more. I think a lot of the times we say we're trusting God, but really we're trusting in ourselves. But we just say, like, I'm trying to learn how to show faith in God here. But really, we just know that's the church answer to give. But really, I'm going to challenge you right now. Like, with every action, I'm still trying to do this myself. Like, and I'm going to the rest of my life. Like, look, like, search your heart and see, are you truly living by faith? Are you, in every single moment, are you living by faith? A lot of the times, you know, we talk about praying like a prayer and then getting baptized and stuff. And then people think, like, that's faith. Well, that's the equivalent of standing across an altar from a woman and saying, I do, and thinking that means I'm faithful to her. No, that's me pledging to be faithful to her. The way that I demonstrate that I have faith in her and that she can have faith in me is that I stay faithful to her throughout the rest of my life. That's marriage, right? Marriage is a beautiful picture of the gospel because in marriage, you get to see faith in action. And it's the same thing with God. You can tell him, you can pray that prayer. That's the equivalent of giving your vows and saying, I do, at the altar of marriage. But then, throughout the rest of your life, you've got to show that you can trust him and that he can trust you. And we want to be examples of that for people. I've noticed a lot of the times, I always, uh, every morning I wake up and I read one chapter of the Bible, and then I journal about it, right? It's become like a very, uh, like a, it's something I try to hold myself accountable to. And I always try to write a certain amount of each day to where it ends up being usually an hour or an hour and a half, just on one chapter. And I've noticed recently, whenever I'm writing stuff, I'm writing the correct things. Like if, if somebody were to read my journal, they'd be like, man, this guy's got it together. But then as I reflect on it, I look at my own heart and I'm like, but I'm not living according to that. It's like I know it to be true and I know I should exercise trust in God in this way. And I can write passionately and you would be like, wow, man, this is the godliest guy ever. But I'm not the godliest guy ever. Like I look at that and I'm like, man, it's, it's weird how there's a disconnect between knowledge and of something and knowledge of the heart where you actually live it out but paul is talking to timothy here and he's saying you need to be an example of the faith you need to live it out it's one thing to know it you can know every story of the bible but so did the pharisees the pharisees like in jesus time you know he's the those are the people that jesus got onto the most and the interesting thing about that i actually just had to write a paper on this jesus and the pharisees their teachings weren't that different they were very similar and that's why jesus got onto them so much because they had everything so close to being correct, but the issue was is that their hearts weren't there. And so they were living out, they were living out in obedience to God, but it wasn't because they trusted him, it was because they just wanted to appear righteous. And so I'm going to challenge you, look into your heart. Are you living by faith, or are you just going through the motions of dead religion? A lot of times people say Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. I'm not going to say that, I'm going to say it's a religion and a relationship. Right? It's a religion that doesn't make sense unless the relationship comes first. Dead religion is not what Christianity is. It's a religion that's alive and it's living for God every single moment. The Bible says that anything not done in faith is sin. Anything that you do that is not actively trusting in God, that's declared sinful. So I want to challenge you. Are you living by faith? And then lastly, Paul says that we are to be examples in purity. And this really kind of ties all the things together. The things you say, the things you do, the way you love, the way you live by faith, all those should be pure. Like if, you, like if you think like a clear glass of water, right? You can tell whenever just something tiny is just floating in there. You don't want people to see that in you. When people look at you, when they see the way you love, they should be like, man, I don't get it. Like there's nothing wrong with this person. And obviously there is something wrong with us because we're all going to be sinful and we're all going to mess up until we're raised to glory in the last days. But we should still be an example and we should strive for that purity even if we can't attain it. The Spirit will hold, help us out, and that's the thing. We, we can't do this on our own. We're going to pray to God and say, God, help me do it because I can't do it on my own. Whenever you try to do it on your own, I'm telling you, you are setting yourself up for failure. But Paul says that we should be examples in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. And then the question arises, how? How do I do these things? Right? Like, it's one thing to say we need to be examples in that, but how do we actually do it? How do we literally live out this Christian life? If I want to be an example of a young person who is living out bananas for Jesus, 
How do I do it? And there's three points uh, I'm going to go through here. I was wanting to spend more time on them, but I don't want to keep you all too long. But y'all are, y'all are paying attention, so I appreciate that. The first uh, point is never forget your creator. This comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Um, Ecclesiastes, I believe, was written by King Solomon, who was the son of David, the person we talked about at the beginning. And Solomon was given everything by God. He was given riches. He was given glory. He was given wisdom, knowledge. He was like, I don't know if you all know what a Renaissance man is, but he was the Renaissance man of his time. He knew everything. He was a botanist, a historian, an architect, a scientist, which I guess a lot of those are. Um, He wrote music. He wrote songs. Music and songs are the same thing. He did a lot of stuff, okay? But eventually, through all those things, he got distracted from God. And he eventually writes this book called Ecclesiastes, where he breaks down every single thing. He says, wisdom, meaningless. Right? And he's not saying uh, it is meaningless in and of itself. He's saying that it is not where we should find our meaning. Right? Being the smartest person, meaningless. That's not where you should find your meaning. Pleasure. The thing, this is really a tough one. Um, the things that you desire in life, that's not where you should find your meaning. He calls it meaningless, like chasing after wind. You chase after it, you try to grab onto it, and it slips through your hands. Right? That's what it is. The word meaningless actually is the Hebrew word hevel, which means the same thing. It's a vapor. You, you think you've got it, and you can see it gathering, and then you close your hand, and it slips right out. And he goes through every single thing to where eventually he actually concludes everything is meaningless under the sun. But he says at the end, in chapter 12, he says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Right? He says, the one place where meaning is found is to remember your Creator. And so I'm going to say, if you want to live this godly life, and you want to be an example, never forget your Creator. Every single moment, think about who you were created. And remember, He created you in His image. You are an image bearer of God. So that means when people look to you, they should see God. Right? Whenever you look in a mirror, you see your image, right? God put his image on us. That means we should bear his image. So never forget your creator. Never forget who you are. The next uh, next point is to observe God's word. Um, This uh, made me think of Luke chapter 2, a story of Jesus. Um, The one story we have of Jesus whenever he was young, other than the nativity story. Right? When Jesus is 12 years old, he goes out, um, his family goes to Jerusalem for Passover, and then whenever his family leaves, they forget Jesus, which had to be a crazy thing. Like, you know, they pray to God, they're like, hey, you know that like one and only son, the Messiah you gave us to take care of? We lost him. It had to be a crazy thing to go through. But they go back, they double back, and Mary and Joseph go looking for Jesus, and where do they find him? In the temple. I knew I'd ask you all another question. Uh, but yeah, so they find Jesus in the temple, And sure enough, what he's doing there is he's actually teaching the older people, right? Jesus is so well-versed in the scriptures that he is blowing the older people's minds because of how much he studied it, which he might have a slight advantage because he actually wrote it, being that he's God. Um, But still, the point remains that this is a young Jesus, 12 years old, who is in the temple teaching the older people, who he probably eventually argued with later on when he grew up. Honestly, he was probably arguing with them then. Um, But respecting them, because you respect the elders. But once again, so the second point is to observe God's word. Never forget your creator, observe God's word. Study it. Like literally one chapter a day, but don't, I'm not going to say like five minutes a day. I think God deserves more than that. You know, like if if you're going to do one chapter a day, go deep into it, right? Immerse yourself into the story. You know, or if it's not a story, immerse yourself into the teaching. Pray to God. Say, God, I can't read this on my own. Teach me your word. Help me understand it and help me apply it and help me reflect you. The last point is to wear humility. Uh, if you will, we're going to flip to one passage and then I'm going to wrap us up. Uh, Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to start in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
So a constant thing throughout the Gospels is this question, who is going to be the greatest? And what Jesus points out here is that that's the wrong question to ask. You don't want to ask who's going to be the greatest. You don't want to strive to be the greatest. Rather, you want to strive to be the least. You want to humble yourself. And what he does here is he calls forth a child to demonstrate it. And he says that you have to have the faith of a child. And there's a difference here. There's a difference between being childlike and childish. We want to be childlike. We don't want to be childish. Childish, that's whenever you're stubborn, you're obstinate, you don't want to listen to authority. That's whenever you're going through the rebellion years. You know, these are those teenage years that uh, parents often talk about. Uh, That's being childish, whenever you're just rebelling. But to be childlike, that's a faith that we need. Imagine a little baby, right? A baby, it has to trust its parents. It can't do anything on its own, right? It can't even go to the restroom by itself. Right? And we need childlike faith, for we are trusting God with everything. We literally, like, when we wake up in the morning, like, a lot of times the first thing we think of is, what do I need to do today? The first thing we, need to, we should think is we should say, God, I can't even get up from this bed without your help. Because you know what? We could, like, God, like, God gave us life. Every single breath is a gift. The fact that I can move my arms, the fact that I can wiggle my toes, that's more grace. Right? The fact that I'm not just paralyzed right here. Right? Just getting up out of bed, that's God helping you out. You can't go throughout your day without that. So maybe we need to humble ourselves and realize anything that I actually accomplish in life, the glory goes to God. And so I'm just going to challenge you all to wear that childlike faith where you're trusting him with everything, every single moment. And so we've got three points. Never forget your creator, observe God's word, and wear humility. I tried to make that an acronym. It spells N-O-W now right so when do you want to go and show your faith right now don't put it off till you're older a lot of times we can say that we can say you know what when i get older i'll get more devoted and i'll go to church more well i can tell you this god isn't focused on how much you're going to church i'm focused on how much you're going to church i want you to come to church as much as possible god's focused on your heart i look to the outward appearance and i try to discern the inside god he knows the inside he knows where your heart's at And so I want you at church as much as possible, but God really cares about your heart. So when can you show your faith? Right now. So I'm just going to challenge y'all to go out and actually do it. Like, it's very easy. We can, people can look at young people and they can think, you know what? They've got a lot of growing to do. And we do. We need to admit that. That's part of the humility. But we also want to be an example for them. So that by our example, whenever they see us, they're like, man, that person's just shining Jesus Christ. It inspires them. And they're like, wow. And I'm 20 years older than them. I need to step it up. You know, if if we are setting a high standard, it's holding everybody else accountable. We want it to be where all of us are present in the worship service and everybody just notices, man, those kids are paying attention. They're taking notes. They actually care about Jesus. They're not talking to one another. Most kids would, but these kids, they're different. They're set apart. They're being examples in their conduct, in their speech, in their purity, in their love, in their faith. So I'm just going to challenge y'all to go out and do that. Don't just hear these words I'm saying, nod your head and be like, oh yeah, that was good. No, like when you get up from this place, literally go out and every single thing, ask yourself, am I exercising faith in God right now? Am I showing him love? Am I giving him glory? It's a really tough thing and I think a lot of times we can get distracted, but I'm really going to challenge y'all to actually go and do that. Um, So that all being said, I just want to remind you that you can make a difference, right? You don't have to wait till you're older. Even when you're young, you can make a difference. Don't let people underestimate you, but go out and just shine your light for the glory of God. I'm going to pray for us, and then th- thank you so much for actually being quiet and listening. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then y'all can get up and go play. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be an ambassador for you. A lot of the times we take it for granted and a lot of the times we groan and moan that we have to obey you in things we might not particularly like obeying. But God, it's really a privilege that you even made yourself known to us. The fact that you, the God of creation, would make yourself known and would even die for us, undeserving sinners. God, we don't want to take that for granted. Help us to truly go out and live for you that the lamb that was slain may receive the reward due his suffering that we will give you the glory you deserve each and every moment and live for you each and every day, setting an example for people in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. 
We love you, God. We thank you. We give the rest of this night to you. Let us not go from here unchanged. It's in your name we pray. Amen.